Medieval Gold and Silver Money It is classically defined as any circulating medium of exchange. These days, economists estimate that over 90% of money exists in digital form. But for many centuries, real, physical gold and silver were the preferred vehicles driving commerce. Now, since abandoning the gold standard, we have further enabled social mobility and a higher living standard using debt as a pillar of our fiat system. But will we ever return to precious metals as a currency? And why do people even value metals in the first place? How did the desire for gold and silver shape history from medieval times up to today? To answer these questions and more, we're here at Charles University, one of the oldest and most prestigious universities in all of Europe. Our guest, Professor Roman Zaudal, PhD, has invited us to the Humanities Department to give us a glimpse on what economies were like hundreds of years ago. And when you compare their problems to ours, you'll soon realize people never learn. Hey, I'm Louis Risk, and I'm here with Vincent D'Iso, and our guest for today is Dr. Roman Zawadal, a senior lecturer at the Charles University here in Prague, one of the oldest universities in the world and the oldest in Central Europe. Uh, so, Dr. Zawadal, thank you very much for doing this. With pleasure. Okay. So, can you tell us a little bit about your background, um, you know, what you teach, um, you know, how long you've been teaching here, etc.? Well, I studied at Charles University here in Prague and then later at Central European University in Budapest. And I spent some time at foreign universities in England, in London and Oxford, but also in other countries in Europe. Uh, my career started uh, uh, in, in the Academy of Sciences, in the Institute for history, but it was still in the period of communism in our country and this workplace was very ideologized. Mm. And so I decided to move <laughs> from there. And what and year was this? It around, was, around what year was this? Yeah, it was, they are 1980s. Okay. 1980s. Yeah, 1980s. And uh, well, I moved to the National Museum and at that time I started to uh, study money because I worked at the Department of uh, Coins and Medals. Oh, and uh, well, it was an important impulse for me uh, to study medieval finances. And uh, after uh, the Velvet Revolution, I, it was possible to teach at universities. Well, I start, started to teach uh, first in Olomouc, where I live, and then here in Prague. Uh, I teach here at our faculty already uh, for 18 years. And uh, well, I am very satisfied here because I have very good colleagues and I like to be in contact with students. You like your students? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're good students. <laughs> yes. Okay, and uh, tell us a little bit about the book that you've written. Yes. It is a book called Money and Finance in Central Europe mm -hmm. during the later Middle Ages, which has been published by uh, Palgrave Macmillan Publishing House uh, within the series Palgrave Studies in the History of Finance. It is an, out, an output of, uh, of the international conference, which I organized some years ago here in Prague. And my colleagues from England asked me to publish it because it has not been uh, no uh, uh, publication about this topic in Central Europe 
in English language available. So you're the there's first. N- there's <laughs> never been a book like this before. Yes. No one's ever written about the yeah, medieval was, financial was, systems. It, it was always uh, about Western Europe. Yeah. But uh, it is very difficult for uh, Westerners to study uh, the situation in Central Europe because of languages. Right. <laughs> languages represent a big barrier. And that's why I, I try to summarize uh, also bibliography of Central European historiographies about this topic and then to, uh, to uh, write about money in different contexts at court, in, uh, in minting, in, uh, with, in towns and their role in church. Uh-huh. Church, <laughs> because yes. this period was uh, during the Holy Roman Empire, correct? Yes, yes. Can you just explain just a little bit about what the Holy Roman Empire was? Yeah. Was it holy? Was it Roman? Was it an empire? <laughs> <laughs> it was an artificial uh, state, mm-hmm. but in the Middle Ages we can't speak about state in the modern sense. Uh, uh, it's called Roman because it has, uh, 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 it should be continuation of ancient Rome, Roman Empire. Uh, and it was a big territory which was connected only by the person of the ruler. Uh, the territory which covered uh, uh, territory from today's Netherlands up to today's Russia in Kaliningrad, in the Baltic, and from the Danish-German border to central Italy. Hmm. Uh, well, and the Czech lands uh, were part of, of this empire, and uh, in the 14th and 15th century, uh, uh, the, the kings of Bohemia from the Luxembourg of uh, from the dynasty of Luxembourg were also kings and emperors of this holy Roman Empire. And how did the money work back then? I mean, if you had currency uh, around Rome, could you use that currency all the way up to the, the borders of, of what would be now Russia and into the Netherlands? Did they have the same currency? Did they have different Not at coins? all, not at all. <laughs> was, there, was there an exchange place? I mean, like, what was it like uh, yes. for, for trading and, and how did the commerce work? Difference, because it was, uh, Holy Roman Empire was a political unit, but economic units are something different. They were uh, big differences uh, between those territories which were in direct contact with old Roman uh, Empire and those who were not in this contact. That's why uh, Western Europe and uh, the Rhine, uh, the, the rivers Rhine and Danube, which represented uh, the border of the ancient Roman Empire, were much more developed also from the economic point of view than the area north from this uh, and eastern from these uh, rivers and uh, it includes also the Czech lands. <laughs> That's why they were different currency systems on these territories. And did these currencies ever have crises or did they collapse and other ones have to come in and and take their place did those sorts of things happen um, in the medieval times yes it was uh, uh, it is important uh, to have uh, uh, silver and gold supply because uh, medieval coin means uh, uh, to have uh, uh, to have uh, uh, precious metal enough uh, and the value of this coin is done by the, the content of uh, precious metal in it. Uh, we speak about the so-called finances of coins. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, even uh, um, Flanders and uh, uh, Northern Italy represented the most developed uh, regions of medieval Europe. Uh, they needed silver from Bohemia and gold from Hungary because they were two larger uh, suppliers in Europe at that time. 
so that uh, the medieval trade um, um, operated within this triangle. Interesting. And uh, Kutna Hora was the big silver mine. Yes, there, right. Uh, it uh, the silver was discovered there in about 1280s, but largely in the, the first half of the 14th century. Um, uh, silver uh, from Kutna Hora played very important role, and uh, uh, coins minted from this silver Prague Groschen became very popular in uh, whole Europe. How were these coins valued? Was there a central agency that was determining the price of silver, or the price of gold, or what it would be worth, or how much it should be exchanged for goods and services? How did they determine mm. its value? Yeah. Uh, we know it from accounts of that time and we can say that uh, mm, uh, one grosh, Prague groschen, was uh, the, 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 the limit of the existence and uh, a worker uh, could earn uh, three groschen a day. Uh, usually, and uh, you needed also three groschen a day if you decided to travel somewhere for pilgrimage and so on. And, but of course, uh, 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 the income of uh, uh, merchants or the income of uh, noblemen was much higher. Can you tell us why this period was so important? Uh, to the advancement of, I guess, you know, money, you know, and, and how we how we use it today. Yes, it is important because money, although they are known already from the ancient period, uh, the coin form existed already in the seventh century uh, BC in Lydia. Uh, it was only in the twelfth and thirteenth century when uh, uh, coin became very spread uh, throughout the whole continent and it was because just at that time a uh, new big uh, silver and gold mines were discovered in Bohemia and uh, Hungary and that's why uh, uh, the issues of these coins were numbered in million uh, pieces. So just because there were just there was more gold and silver being spread out all over the all over Europe, pretty much. Yeah, silver silver always played the most important role uh, because uh, silver coins were used in everyday life by majority of inhabitants, while uh, gold coins were used mainly for long distance trade and for political payments uh, of uh, the rulers or for the uh, organizing crusades and other military campaigns. Yeah, I mean, speaking of that, as, as the Western European powers pursued their um, goals of colonialization abroad, uh, I imagine they needed more gold and silver. So what sort of conflicts arose from uh, the desire of expansion from the West? What, what sort of consequences or repercussions were felt on the other side of Europe inward from, from this? Was there any sort of conflicts or? Uh, you mean the impact? The impact of, 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 the, of the high demand for gold and silver, especially uh, in the West, as they wanted mm -hmm. to, to grow mm -hmm. and expand. Mm -hmm. What happened during that time period, because people don't think about this part of the world as much, being the neighbors of, of them. Um, mm -hmm. How were they affected by, by that growing demand mm -hmm. of gold and silver? Of course, gold attracted uh, mainly the most developed regions. Uh, it means mainly Flanders and North Italy in the 14th and 15th centuries. And uh, uh, so we can uh, find uh, there also a lot of hordes with uh, Central European hordes, uh, coins, yeah. yes, hordes. Uh, and uh, they are also mentioned in, in written sources, in the account books uh, or in the manuals of merchants and so on. And uh, it was an important uh, uh, 
um, supply for uh, production of West European coins. Uh, and uh, well, but these supplies were limited, of course. And at the end of the 14th century, uh, uh, it was still uh, fewer and fewer uh, metals in Central Europe available. And it was the reason for the financial crisis in the 15th century then. Yeah, well, tell us about that. Tell us about this, this financial crisis in the 15th century. Uh, well, this uh, uh, problem uh, was, uh, mm, was of large, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a big problem for the whole continent at that time because uh, uh, the trade, the volume of trade was still bigger and it was not uh, quality good uh, coins enough. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, it, it is typical the debasement. The debasement of coins is a typical feature, feature for this period. It means the new issues of coins uh, content uh, uh, less uh, uh, silver mm -hmm. than before. So, so I mean the e economies across Europe were growing and they needed more, just more silver, more gold, yes. but there, were, yes. there was not enough silver or gold. Of course. So they, <laughs> they just made, you know, uh, coins with mm -hmm. fewer amounts. Mm -hmm. did, did, uh, who was in charge of this? Kings or? Yes, yes. Okay. Kings issued uh, these, uh, uh, these coins. And but debased coins. Debased coins. Okay. What, what was the metals that they were? What were the metals that they were using uh, to replace the gold and silver? Uh, it was copper, copper. mainly, okay. yeah. or other uh, metals. That felt the same as yeah. gold or silver. Uh, and it was problem for ordinary people mainly because uh, if uh, the coin had uh, the same image mm -hmm. and picture, it was not possible to recognize. Uh, uh, the quality of coins at yeah. first sight. It was known only to mint masters and merchants. So they knew that <laughs> yes, the coins they were knew debased? It was oh. financial elite, <laughs> which <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> knew everything about and that. And everybody else had no idea? No idea. So wh what, when did they find out? But they recognized it <laughs> when they could buy less in, in the market. Oh, yes, God. the purchasing yeah. power was smaller than before. Interesting. So I'm already seeing a lot of parallels yeah. to today's economic yeah. problems yeah. with fiat yeah. currency yeah. and inflation. Yeah. 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 It's interesting how that has been uh, computerized so and digitalized. Yeah. Were there revolts by, by the, the citizens or what, what happened during this crisis? Uh, well, uh, the, the deepest crisis uh, is uh, connected with war uh, conflicts uh, on the continent, mainly with the Hundred Years' War and the Hussite War in, in Bohemia. And uh, the most critical situation, it was in about uh, the 1420s, for example, French penny or Bohemian penny was very small value. In fact, it was uh, 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 rather credit uh, money than, than a, a true money because it contained no, no precious metal, in fact. Mm -hmm. So it's like a real penny. Yes. Today. yes. <laughs> yeah. Back then, a real, real penny, penny would be considered counterfeit uh -huh. and pretty much worthless. So, so mm -hmm. When I try and think back in this time period, it's very hard to imagine. But were there like ebbs and flows, with you know highs and lows? Um, the economy was doing good, and then it was doing bad. Was there such a thing as a recession or a depression mm -hmm. back then? And if so, what did it look like, and how did they bounce back from these things? Mm -hmm. Well, it's typical for the whole economic development that uh, uh, it. Uh, functioned in uh, waves and uh, uh, well 
It was also influenced uh, by other factors like Black Death, for example. In the Black Death? Black Death. Oh, Black Death. The plague. In, in, yeah. in yeah. the 14th yeah. century, yeah, sure. when a lot of people died and it was not uh, uh, labor forces at all, uh, enough. And that's why uh, wages increased. Because everyone was dying. Yes. <laughs> no, nobody could work. Everyone was dead. Increased demand for labor. Which was yeah, exactly. problem oh, for, uh, for some uh, noblemen who had to pay more for labor than before. Oh. And they bankrupted because of it, because they, they didn't yeah. have money for that. Wow. Yeah. It was very easy to bankrupt in the Middle Ages because uh, uh, the society was not prepared for some bigger uh, crashes. So, yeah, exactly. Some crisis. It's, mm, it's some more crisis. fragile. Um, so, so tell us about some of the other uh, financial crises that happened in Europe, uh, um, I guess, you know, after the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we know about uh, the crisis already before, for example, in the 13th century, but later it was, uh, it was uh, in the 16th century. That's another uh, important period uh, because of the discovery of uh, America and uh, Europe was supplied by gold and silver right. uh, from uh, Latin America and it represented, fl represented flourishing period mm -hmm. uh, mainly for Western Europe. But uh, uh, then again a new crisis came at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, which was then connected with 30 years war. Did, did some of that crisis, um, was that the result of too much silver and metal coming in from Latin America? Uh, you know, everything, uh, 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 um, the prices and wages uh, were much higher than before. And we can speak about uh, um, big divergence in uh, Western Europe and little divergence in Central Europe. That's the period mm -hmm. when the, the history of these two regions uh, uh, split, right? uh, split uh, um, uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the volume of means in Western Europe was much bigger uh, than here in Central Europe, although here in Central Europe new silver mines were discovered in Joachimsthal, where also new uh, form of coins were minted, the so-called Thaler, and this Thaler became so popular also in America that it's origin of today's American dollar. The taller. Yeah, yeah. Okay. taller. <laughs> taller. The dollar came from the taller. Yeah, from taller. Where was in, the taller in, exactly this is, uh, created? This is Austro Hungarian Empire. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, Western Bohemia. Western Bohemia. Bohemia in the Or Mountains, uh, uh, the city called Joachimsthal in German, yeah. ja Joachimov in Czech. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, it means the valley of uh, uh, St. James. Mm -hmm. James. And uh, this uh, from this tal in german is the name for coin taler okay but, but um is is the taler was it just a, a paper receipt for for the coin so you didn't have to it was a silver big silver coin it was a big silver coin, coin. Yes. it was just called it just had a name mm -hmm. okay yes, all right yes, all right yes, yes, yes. all right because at some point they well my, when did they start uh using paper as a as a receipt or or ah, it was only in the in the 18th century. That was the 18th century. Where Much that later, uh, in the period of the first banks, mm -hmm. uh, here in the region north of the Alps, uh, but uh, the first banks uh, uh, came um, already originated already in the 12th and 13th century in Italy. Italy had the Italy, first Italy, yes, because Italy was uh, the most important financial center 
in the Middle Ages and even in the modern period, uh, um, the merchants from Florence mm -hmm. financed Pope as well as all Christian rulers at that time. Interesting. Where were the first banks ever um, in the history of civilization? Do you know where banking was invented? Uh, it was uh, much older. Uh, the first banks of civilization are known from Assyria and uh, from uh, Babylonia, wow, uh, that, from that was ancient, years ago. Yeah. ancient civilizations. Yeah. Interesting. But modern banking basically started in Italy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For, yeah. You know, how we know yeah, it yeah, now. Yeah. 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 And uh, I think it was in the Netherlands where um, uh, everyone loved tulip bulbs. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's true that it was possible uh, to use also other forms than, uh, than metal. Um, uh, be uh, for example, uh, cocoa beans or uh, shells um, or uh, uh, salt, for example. Uh, but uh, these coins, uh, metal coins, are uh, most advantages because it's uh, possible to cut them and to measure them. They have a, a very consist uh, form uh, and it's, it's the reason why they prevailed then from all other uh, forms of payments. And it seems like uh, the history is moving towards integration, right? Like Europe has has you know been integrated, and now the world is integrating, you know, monetarily with uh, all the economic systems. Uh, where do you think we're going in the future? Do you think we're going to continue integrating? It's just to be one, you know, large uh, economy, or mm -hmm. you know, how do how do you think the future is going to be like? Uh, although there are some problems which we can see also today and uh, uh, just uh, uh, we can uh, mention the, the last crisis of 2007-2008 uh, and the principles of this crisis are always the same because uh, um, people, uh, the bank, banks uh, uh, don't have money enough at disposal and everything uh, has to be paid by citizens of the state like uh, by uh, subjects in the Middle Ages. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the market will be surely still more and more integrated but uh, I believe that this uh, present form of coins, uh, cash, uh, small change, will be still necessary. You don't people. think you don't think cash is going away? <laughs> if you if you would need to buy something in the street from not from big shops, but I mean from somebody. Uh, who has no uh, perm permission permission for for selling just black yeah. black market a lottery ticket yes it's it's <laughs> necessary uh, to have uh, cash but can can you imagine a future where everyone has like a, a debit card or some sort of chip and we have uh, the same sort of um, like value uh, overseas country to country and we all agree as long as we all agree it's worth something it's worth something and we could exchange it can you see that unfolding or you think there will always be a need for for something tangible in your hand mm -hmm. to hand over mm -hmm. uh, well as i said i mean yes all uh, bigger payments or everyday life payments uh, will be possible to to pay by credit cards or some in a, other chips and other forms, electronic forms. But on the other side, uh, uh, if you would uh, need, there are a lot of situations 
when you need uh, small, small change, yeah, small change. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a part of everyday life. So you don't think that's going away ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the form of money has changed, you know, uh, we're not carrying around gold coins or silver coins, mm -hmm. you know, we use notes mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. But now, um, you know, with the invention of cryptocurrencies, uh, it seems like it, it's it's changing again. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, do you think this is a passing fad, or do you think cryptocurrencies will you know continue to get more popular, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and will be using you know like Bitcoin mm -hmm. often instead of? Yes, cryptocurrency is a different uh, form from Fed money, mm -hmm. and Fed money is also a different form from commodity money. Right, fiat fiat money. Fiat yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Which were the Federal Reserve <laughs> before, and uh, um, uh, so uh, uh, the specifics of uh, Bitcoin is that is uh, carried out collectively by the network, and that uh, uh, decentralization renders Bitcoins and other uh, forms of coin free from government manipulation mm -hmm. uh, and it is uh, uh, possible to uh, uh, to uh, or fiat currency issuance is a highly centralized activity supervised by a nation's central bank which is not uh, with crypto uh, currency and I think uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the interest uh, of this uh, for this uh, form of coins inc is increasing, mm -hmm. but in fact uh, there are barriers uh, for the future uh, to become as too much spread form of money because uh, uh, it's. Uh, uh, the relative complexity compared to conventional currencies uh, will deter most people except for the technologically adept. So we think it it's, is it's necessary to know right. uh, quite well electronic system to be able to... But don't, don't you think the next generation of students, I mean, you see them in your classrooms, you know, they're, they are technologically adept can you imagine a, a world where even their kids mm -hmm. are there? They're, I mean, mm -hmm. knowing about computers is going to be possibly fundamental in, in even in their elementary school. So do you think maybe that uh, cryptocurrencies or some something that's digital, 100 percent digital can can. But, you know, yeah, anything future. in history, uh, even in the future, exists in 100 percent, 100 percent. It, uh, I don't believe it covers the whole society. Mm -hmm. it, it is always, uh, uh, there are some social strata which will never use it. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it's very like a first world also that, that are using cryptocurrencies. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't use Bitcoin. It is right connected now. with <laughs> education and look yeah. Africa where so many Alphabet, uh, alphabets there still today. Well, I can't imagine it. So you think, uh, do you think <laughs> cryptocurrencies will collapse because they just can't be used? Um, you know, globally, it'll just reach a point where, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's overblown. And then, and then. Um, I think it will be one of uh, uh, other forms of uh, currency. But so it could be used simul not... simultane simultaneously with, uh, simultaneously. with fiat currency. Yes. Okay. So it'll yes, be an option. Fiat. But it won't overtake it, mm -hmm. in your opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> of I guess course, we'll see, right? I am no prophet, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't believe so. Well, and what do you think about this idea of uh, borrowing money, using it, and then you know selling it on the back end in the form of a treasury bond? Do you think that's, which is what we do now, um, is that a sustainable system? Because as we, the years go on, the debt just accumulates and accumulates. And now the numbers are just so high. 
Yeah. And it's not a, even a system design where you can pay off the debt. Mm -hmm. um, is this a sustainable system? Mm -hmm. Do you think this will collapse mm -hmm. at some point? Mm -hmm. What do you think mm -hmm. is going to happen to our current system mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, the economic, uh, economists uh, uh, has the idea about the eternal growth. <laughs> Everything yeah, <right. laughs> has must uh, keep growing, be yeah. growing and growing all yeah. the time, and uh, of course uh, we don't count on collapses very much. We are not prepared for them, but in uh, spite of that, we are still better prepared than people in the Middle Ages, and uh, uh, so. Mm, so this, this, I don't yeah. believe to the eternal to the eternal growth, uh, uh, but uh, uh, well, it's uh, difficult to say uh, what will it will come from 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 your studies over the years, and you've studied several centuries of this. What sort of similarities do you keep seeing? Like what what keeps reappearing in these crises? Is, is there something you could you can tell us that we, we really need to look out for this time around um, or something that like humans just seem to be not learning their lesson from. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference is that the capital is diversified at many different places, which was not so before. And also uh, currency unions help but currency union is nothing new uh, uh, because it was known already in the Middle Ages. Uh, By a currency in, in, union, in you the, specifically mean the Eurozone? Yes, I mean, for example, today, yeah. Eurozone. Mm. And um, mm, we know it already in ancient Greece or uh, in medieval Europe, where, where more uh, small medieval states uh, minted one uh, common uh, one coin uh, because it was advantages for all sides uh, and uh, mm, but uh, uh, all these uh, unions uh, uh, were only temporarily well that's the question uh, you know I, why why that is do you study why these are temporary. Uh, temporary, because uh, it was um, uh, uh, connected with uh, momental uh, economic development uh, when uh, one state became more uh, wealthy than another than before, uh -huh. because uh, you discovered silver there mm -hmm. <laughs> or something like this. It was not advantage to have a, uh, one common coin because the king wanted to, to produce their own uh, currency and uh, to, to influence by this currency all other regions. Mm -hmm. do, do you think that's happening uh, now a little bit with uh, the European Union cur currently? Uh, uh, European uh, uh, currency is, I think, uh, very, uh, very good uh, means, uh, but of course uh, it, uh, it is necessary uh, uh, to have uh, uh, states on the same economic level. And it is not so in the case of among the countries of European Union. And they are weaker countries like Greece or mm. uh, Spain, Portugal, or, yeah. <laughs> Portugal and so on. And uh, uh, then they are very strong, uh, uh, economically strong uh, uh, states like uh, Germany, mm. who has to pay for these weaker uh, countries. And, uh, but it is a possibility how to uh, minimize these uh, differences between different 
European regions. Yeah, but that, that takes a lot of political will, right? I mean, you need political the politicians and, to... and it takes a lot of time also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are you optimistic uh, about the, the euro and the monetary union in, in Europe? Uh, yes, yes. I'm quite optimistic. I, I noticed that gold has really stabilized over the last few years and the volume has decreased substantially. And I think silver as well. Do you think uh, in the next few years there will be a, another gold rush? There's going to be a return to gold? You know, uh, present currency is not uh, covered by gold uh, like it was before uh, because there are uh, other possibilities. But uh, gold uh, is or uh, precious metals play important role uh, still in the period of crisis. When the economy goes down, then the value of uh, uh, precious metal goes high, is higher and higher. Well, that's uh, such um, um, uh, secure security uh, uh, for uh, the critical moments in the, the, in the economic development. So when there's a collapse, yes, buy gold. <laughs> buy gold. And that's why it's necessary yeah. that the national banks would have uh, some sources of gold for critical periods. Do you think that will ever change? Yeah. Even in the future, do you think we'll still rely or, or uh, central banks will still have gold? Do you think that will ever change in the history of humanity? You know. Uh, well, it's difficult to imagine. Um, uh, it's not possible to, to learn in this sense from history. Well, it has to be some new, absolutely new phenomenon, uh, like general use of these cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. But but you're pessimistic about this. But right? I am. There are a lot of barriers for that. Can you tell us why you think it's important to study these matters, especially for your students? Well, it's important for everybody to, uh, for their practical everyday life, uh, to know how finance uh, uh, works and uh, how to use uh, money and this, uh, uh, how to behave during the uh, financial crisis, for example, and uh, to understand the whole mechanism of uh, uh, the changing values of money. Uh, I think it's very practical. And over the years of you teaching um, and, and writing books and, and, and studying yourself, can you tell us um, some of the most interesting things you've learned personally um, from this subject matter? Yes, uh, for me, uh, it was interesting uh, to learn that uh, um, many bankruptcies uh, uh, were known uh, uh, already in old periods and that uh, people don't want to learn from history. <laughs> because uh, uh, it, uh, 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 each society has its uh, hierarchy and uh, uh, states were running into debt uh, already 100 years ago, like for example in the early 14th century Bohemia when the uh, bankers from Florence came to Prague and they uh, s started to mint a new form of coins, Prague Groschen. Uh, and uh, uh, King and other uh, aristocracies uh, uh, lent money for interest from them, but they did not want to pay then. Uh, and of course, it was then uh, the problem for banks, uh, like today. <laughs> and uh, all that, as I said, has to be paid by the subjects 
of, of kings in the Middle Ages. Mm, well, market was always regulated by state and the largest bankruptcies uh, are connected always with wars and caused by totalitarian regimes because people living in a big insecurity usually accept simplified solutions and it's very topical <laughs> i think uh, even today here in europe as well as in the usa a lot of what you're saying is resonating and even though you're talking about history i feel like you're talking about the current situation sometimes yeah, here yeah wow and uh, what sort of advice do you have um for any any students out there that are looking for something to study um, and they might be interested in humanities um, his, or history of money or other classes you offer um, why, why is it uh, a good thing to study humanities uh, I think it's a general view into functioning of society uh, when you should uh, decide at the elections whom to vote then it's necessary to know a history at least of the past century because a lot of things uh, has uh, repeat repeat is repeating uh, but uh, also on the different level but you can learn a lot from uh, the functioning of uh, the power uh, and power balance between economic and political uh, plans uh, between democracy and totalitarian regimes uh, so it's a very good uh, weapon against uh, populism i think uh, uh, the educate we need educated society uh, which uh, would be able to uh, understand their uh, present uh, uh, time and not to believe to populists. Well, would you agree that if uh, the, the society was educated, then populism would be good because they would understand what was really happening around them and then the majority opinions would be similar and also well informed i think it's the role of universities yeah and after uh, uh, the last uh, elections here in the czech republic uh, many universities try to uh, to educate uh, people in countryside where uh, the informations are not uh, so good yeah it was the situation with brexit in yeah. the great britain as well and yeah. the united states yes <laughs> for, for, people, for people who don't know yes. or follow yes. uh, politics yes. in central europe and um, of course it's easy to okay. spread uh, fear then yeah. among people that's kind of what i was getting at yeah. I was for people who don't know the politics here mm -hmm. uh, there was recently a, an election very similar to that of the united states mm -hmm. um, and the president was uh, scapegoating mm -hmm. immigrants yeah. as well right yeah. and that's what you're referring to yeah. and it's absurd because in our country there are almost no foreigners <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> or, yeah. I, I mean uh, <laughs> these, yeah. uh, I think they're against us one and two. not so yeah. much unlike many other countries and in spite of that this uh, fear is uh, among people is supported by some politicians are you hopeful for the future Yes, I am optimist <laughs> in spite Good. of all these problems. Yeah, let's hope so. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> how do we get over our fears? I mean, that's the question for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I guess education, uh, especially in this particular department, mm -hmm. uh, is a great way. Mm -hmm. It's a great way. Mm -hmm. um, the book, maybe, can you tell us where, again, where can we buy the book? Is it available to be ordered online? Yes, it's possible to buy it online uh, uh, on uh, Amazon, for example. Uh, but uh, the book is quite expensive because it's an academic book. Um, it's for other professors. 
<laughs> for other professors, for libraries and so on. Uh, it's uh, available also as an inspection copies for uh, professors at other universities or it's available free when you write book review. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, oh, that's, okay, <laughs> let's do that. Uh, wow. uh, yeah, sure. Any final thoughts, Lewis? No, I just want to thank you very much for agreeing to do this. We really appreciate your time. With pleasure. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> hey, thanks for watching this episode of Do This With Your Life. Now, I've got a question for you. Do you know anyone specifically that you think this episode could help? If so, please share this podcast with that person. The purpose of this show is to help people overcome challenges, solve problems, and take the next step in life. If you think that's a worthy cause, please visit our website, dothispodcast.com, and click on the button to become a patron of our show. Any little donation helps. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. There you can follow us, you can leave comments, ideas for future shows, and receive notifications every time we release an episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And remember, you are the reason we do this podcast. <laughs>